Hey everybody, it's Ken Komet, condovoice.com. Thanks for joining me today. Today we're going to do another segment on SB4D, the new law, the building safety law for the state of Florida. So today what I thought I'd do is take you through the chronology of how this bill got voted on and adopted and into law. So uh, just a little history lesson here, just in case you weren't aware, um, <clears throat> but I think it's important and you'll see why when I explain. So, all right, in 2008, the legislature decided to vote a similar law into effect. And it, it got into law. There was no big news about it other than, hey, okay, what is this? It was kind of a, a new thing. Um, <clears throat> we had had some issues in the industry, but nothing compared to Champlain Towers. Anyway, so... Uh, we had the Great Recession, 2008-2009 financial crisis, and in 2010, due to it being too expensive, uh, according to the state government website, uh, they rescinded the law. So, even though people may have tried to comply, they didn't have to, it was a moot point. So, <clears throat> but it did raise awareness of reserves, reserve funding, building inspections, coastal corrosion, structural issues related to corrosion and the lack of maintenance done by condo associations and HOAs. So more than even the lack of maintenance was the will of the people, the lack of the will of the people to actually do anything about corrosion. So it's always, it was always up until then, look the other way. We don't really want to hear it. It's going to cost money. We don't have budgeted. We don't want to bring that news to the residents so on and so forth. It's a trail of, I wouldn't use the word corruption. Uh, I might say denial, uh, avoidance, thinking, um, things like that. And it's just that when a board member gets elected to a board to serve an annual term or two year term, they really want to get along with their neighbors. They want to be well liked and they want to serve their community in a good way. It's a great concept. However, uh, as long as all the news is good, then it can be a very uh, actually enjoyable experience. On the other hand, when news is bad or when a special assessment has to be levied for whatever reason, justified or not, it, it becomes a miserable experience. You're not well liked in the community. You're always going to have a few people that that come to you and say, hey, what's up? You know, what, what was what was wrong? You know, did you go looking for problems? That kind of thing. So the psychology of boards not addressing structural corrosion issues is, is one that's been around for a long time. I've, I've been managing property for 40 years and I can think of times back in, 19, uh, in the 1990s when boards told me to cover things up. And as a property manager, you do what you're told. Uh, you know, stucco over it. Don't do the big repair, do the small repair, make it look good. Let that be somebody else's problem. Happens a lot. It happens a lot. It's not right, but it, it's just the way things are. It's human nature. All right, so <clears throat> law got rescinded in 2010. Then we had no real big issues in the industry until Champlain Towers. Champlain Towers, I'm sure you're all aware, 98 people died. Half of this building collapsed. I've looked into Champlain Towers somewhat, and I've dug into it quite a bit. I actually inspected a building a lot like Champlain Towers, who had a swimming pool above the ground, above the base floor, parking garage, columns, a big recreational deck around that pool, and I won't share the name or the location, but I will tell you that at that time I noticed corrosion in the pool shell. There was actually rust showing up in the marsite, through the marsite. There were cracks in the marsite, rust in the marsite. The retaining wall that they build around these in the parking garages, um, you know, they're just concrete block. And that wall was sweating. And I could see where the paint was delaminating in certain places where there was a little bit of settlement issues and you could see the crack, the step, stair step type crack in the concrete block. And I could tell that I needed to look inside that. I needed to see the void, what was in the void between the wall and the pool shell. 
because as a young lad, I used to build pools. I mean, for a short time, I did that. I've done a lot of things in construction, and that was one of them. And I've laid the steel in those things. I've, I've shot the concrete, and I've also been a part of the Marsai process. So, you know, I've dug the holes too. So um, I can tell you that I know how pools are built. I know I've also maintained them. So I know how the piping runs and, you know, how everything has to transfer and so forth. So anyway, I had a pretty good idea what was going on, that the pool shell had gotten salt through the Marsite. Marsite is very porous and so is concrete. And so it's gonna absorb. When you have swimming pools right on the Gulf or right on the Atlantic, the water, the, just even the rainwater is a bit salty and even the fog drift comes and settles. And you even have people that just don't shower and they go into the pool. There's all kinds of ways salt gets into that water and that salt is in that water. So the salt gets absorbed by the marsite, it gets absorbed through the concrete, gets absorbed into the layers where the structural steel is, the steel starts to corrode, the salt is a catalyst making the steel bar expand, causing the crack, now you can see it. It's been going on for a while, but now you can see it. Well, the point was um, that pool shell was in jeopardy. And I needed to see, as I was going to drill a hole in the concrete block wall and put a video camera in there and see if we could see, you know, it, it probably was packed with dirt, but it was worth the exercise. Just put a pin in that idea. So I looked at the remainder of the pool deck <clears throat> and the pool deck had drainage issues. Wait a minute. Is this sounding a lot like Champlain Towers? Yes. And so... I prepared a report and I also noticed in the parking garage they had some corrosion going on, but I guess nothing like Champlain. But the, the columns had showed some corrosion. But in that case, <clears throat> and this is just my guess, is that based on the report that I've read about Champlain is that the original construction of Champlain's vertical columns was not what it should be. These columns in this particular property I inspected looked at like they were in pretty good shape actually. It's just they had other corrosion issues. But here's the deal, and I'm just gonna make this point, then I'm gonna proceed on with the chronology since I tripled it, I kind of waded into this area. Vertical columns are not designed for horizontal forces. They're designed for vertical forces to carry a load. So when those columns are put under stress from a vertical event, I can see where design-wise, they wouldn't have the, the strength to hold up under that. And if enough of those columns got messed up, you know, to the degree, to the severity where they would actually collapse, and if there was corrosion going on inside those columns to the steel bars, I could see where their strength would be compromised. I could see a setup. Anyway, I wrote up a report, I gave it to him. I said, look, you've got to get inside that pool shell. You've got to see the condition of that. Because if the pool fails, there's so much water in that pool that the, the retaining wall also needed to be drilled to see whether it had any reinforcing in it or poured cells with the concrete or any type of, you know, probably it wasn't. Probably it was just a concrete block wall, you know, really aesthetic. It served no purpose other than to hold the dirt because the pool itself was being supported by itself, we believe. And the plans for the building were sketchy. So I couldn't really determine those things. So who knows whether the deck itself was tied in to some columns next to it with steel. It, there was no way to really tell that. Bottom line is, if that pool shell failed for any reason, it may have, or most probably would have collapsed that concrete retaining wall. And the force of the block, the water, the shell of the pool itself, all that going horizontally could have eclipsed on a horizontal force basis those columns holding up well, at this point, it wasn't the building. It was actually just the, the recreational deck. So there could have been a collapse there, all right? Um, it could have extended into the building columns too. I mean, it could have. So there's a domino effect that happens. But th these are things that just, there's no, there's no data for this. I mean, this was a one-time event, so uh, as far as I know. And I told them they needed to do the proper maintenance to, to do, and to do further inspections, and they said, no, thank you. They just simply didn't want to do it. They said it was too much money. They, they didn't want to, I didn't even give them an estimate. I just said, I need to do more. And you need a contractor in here to help me do the invasive work that needed to be done in order to determine exactly where we were. So we could then hand it off to an engineer and say, here, okay, make us a repair design. That was the smart, right thing to do. 
But the psychology of the boards and the people are, they don't want to spend the money. They don't think it's justified. <laughs> you know, severe property damage, it's one thing to say, hey, the sky is falling. It's another thing to see it and show them pictures, videos, and say, these are big problems. They are big problems. They were structural problems. When you see rust bleeding up through a severe crack, that means that steel bar is compromised. That means that's a structural issue. If there's a steel bar in there and it's up off the ground somehow, if it's a suspended slab of any kind, vertical or horizontal, it's a structural slab, okay? On the ground is different because the ground is supporting it. But when it's being supported by the structural steel itself and anything attached to it, that's structural. So when you start looking at your inspections and what you have to do, and you're looking at trying to understand what does that mean the, the first inspection's a visual or a cursory. That means you're just gonna look at it. They're not gonna do anything to it. The second inspection, if necessary, based on the results of the first inspection, are it's a structural, it's an invasive. That, that's what I wanted to do. This is exactly, I mean, I did this 12 years ago, but I can just tell you the thinking process is the same for anyone who does this. This is common. So anyway, um, all right, I just wanted to share that with you, but let's move on. So, okay, so we had Champlain Towers and we had an immense payoff from the insurance company to the people affected. Um, it, it, at the same time, we had an insurance industry in Florida that was reeling under the attorney lawsuits. Okay, so here's, here's what happened. And really SB4D and SB2D, both of them failed more or less in the regular session of the 2022 uh, legislature and they didn't get voted in. It, it looked like they were going to, but they just stopped. And so here's what happened. Um, SB 1702 and House Bill 7069, they're sister, they're sister to each other. And 1702 and 7069 were strictly the building safety law bill. Uh, there was another bill that had to do with the insurance. Right? Just don't have the number with me right now because I'm focusing on SB4D. Um, but what happened was, <clears throat> and I've read the summary analysis on that, basically, and unfortunately, attorneys, they're calling you out. They're saying, look, it's one thing for <clears throat> an insurance company to pay a homeowner or a homeowner association or a condo for roof damage and on an insurance claim. That's what it's for. But what was happening was, you had people suggesting to these condos, HOAs, and community associations that they could maybe get a whole new roof out of it, okay? So they would hire a public adjuster or they would hire an attorney and they would come out, prepare a case, and they would present that to the insurance company saying that, okay, a portion of the roof got damaged, but really the whole roof needs to be replaced. So they would file suit. And then the insurance company, basically when, when this happens, instead of just writing that initial check for what they thought was fair, which, which is really a whole nother issue, right? Insurance company just gets to write you a check and that's it. I mean, where's your advocate in that process? I don't know. But so you do need an advocate and there's, there's a role for a public adjuster or an insurance or an attorney to play. But um, what was happening was people got greedy. And so, they put in the minds of the board member, property manager, whatever, say, look, let's try to get a new roof out of this. So, so the insurance company inevitably paid for a new roof. But what happens, and this is what blows the whole cover off of everything for everybody, the people that win, the consumers that win, what happens is the, the attorneys are awarded huge sums of money for their part in that. In, in their advocacy for the homeowner condo association, they get paid an award. And those awards were, are, are just astronomical. So for example, true story, uh, this came uh, recently. <clears throat> um, so the homeowner association had a roof, I think it was a town home, like six roofs, and they um, filed a claim. They didn't get what they thought they wanted, hired an attorney, the attorney got them a brand new roof, $60,000, great. The award for that, to the attorney was $350,000. $350,000 for a $60,000 claim. That I didn't I don't know the original amount that the associate that the insurance company was willing to pay the HOA, but it was probably somewhere in the neighborhood of like $5,000. So <clears throat> the point of the law was, well, so what happened was 
you know, at the same time that we had the Champlain Towers, we had this insurance crisis for, for two different reasons, both pointing to the same result. So what happened was they merged the building safety law and the roofing insurance issue bill and made them one. So in the special session, they married them. And they said, okay, we're going we're gonna to put the two together. And basically, so they, they, they more or less have eliminated attorney's awards. So that kind of goes away. Six insurance companies went insolvent in the process. So the Office of Insurance Regulation now manages those, the assets of those six companies. <coughs> Excuse me. So here we go. Um, we've got, we've saved the insurance industry somewhat it's not fixed it's just we got a we got a pin in it is what we got and we've also reinstated the building safety thing that was in 2008 which requires reserve reserve studies inspections so on and so forth based on where you're at where you're located how high you are all those things and so now we're we're getting down to business because people died plus we had an economy that was in about to collapse okay you don't get insurance and you have a mortgage, you know what happens. You either pay Lloyd's of London, if you're lucky enough to get insurance, or you don't have insurance and the mortgage company says, well, wait a minute, we can't, we can't allow you to own this home. We can't, we, we're calling the mortgage in, okay? That would have just been disastrous. So <clears throat> even though they didn't do it in the regular session, they did it in the special session, which is probably a good thing, but it was kind of hasty. Because really, a lot more work is required for this SB4D to be effective, economical, fair, all these things, you know, practical. All of these things need to be done in a revision to SB4D to make this plausible, okay? Because the economy, I just don't think people are going to stand for it. I think, you know, back in 2009, <clears throat> they said it was too expensive. If our economy goes down at all, Okay, or even if it doesn't, people are still gonna say it's too expensive. So what are we gonna do? So the question is, is the legislature gonna stay the course this time? Are they gonna, well, people people died, 98 people died. It was a tragedy, it was, shouldn't happen. Well, it happened. So now maybe we won't resend it because we know what the real cost of this is. Heaven forbid another building falls or even a part of a building falls or anybody even gets injured, to be honest. All right, so we're moving forward. We got our um, we got our special session. We got our two new laws passed, and now we got to comply with the two new laws. Um, we've got an insurance market that's in crisis still, so something still needs to be done to it to stabilize the market. Because you know how much you you may know or may not know how much you paid for insurance. I mean, insurances across condo HOA <clears throat> master policies have gone up an average of thirty percent. Some of you, it's doubled. Some of you, not so bad. You know, everybody has their own deal. But that's, and that came to budgets of associations that had already passed their budgets for the next year. <clears throat> so we've got budgets we're living in now that we really didn't, we don't have that. And insurance is one of the biggest line items of any condo or HOA budget, if not at, by far, is my point. So, I can think of examples come to my mind right now. Um, you know, when I shop for insurance this year for my associations, I shopped really hard and got some pretty good deals. And and they were very fortunate, to be honest. Um, <coughs> excuse me. But they still suffered an increase. And I told them, I said, I don't know what next year is going to bring. So based on your renewal date, you know, that's what's got, plus you've got the insurance thing about the roofing law. So, you know, that will have an effect at renewals this year too, during 2023. So we're gonna see what happens. But anyway, um, I just wanna finish the chronology aspect of this thing. So we got our two bills, our two new laws. And <clears throat> so now we're trying to decipher just what they mean. There's deadline dates in these, in these things. So uh, I wanted to tell you, you know, I think I'll hold on for that. This is, this is a long enough video. I'm just, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, do another video here shortly on all of the things, your to-do list.
Okay, you're gonna have a to-do list on what you have to do <clears throat> and what might be optional. So I'll do a whole separate video on that. So we have our two new laws, they're in effect. Now we just have to deal with them. So that's the chronology, that's the history. That's just some background on one example of why, you know. So um, we, we, I still believe that it was hastily done and we could have done better, a lot better, and we can do better. We just have to look at it and say, you know what? We didn't do such a great job. We were well intended, but we gotta get this right because the cost associated with a broad brush, you know, treatment of this thing is just, people are just gonna realize, wait a minute, I don't live on the coast. I live three miles inland. I don't have the corrosion they do. Why should I have to do the same things they do? They have severe issues. We don't have severe issues. We have a long time for corrosion. They have a short time. So that concept alone just completely blows my mind. And I have, I have a lot of ideas, very practical ideas that I think the law should be rewritten with that I'm gonna communicate and hopefully someone will listen. And it will save a lot of people a lot of money and a lot of hassle too, to be honest with you. So <clears throat> the people that need to have this done need to get it done. I mean, right away, because property and lives could be at risk. The people that are three miles inland, seriously? I mean, I've managed properties inland and I've managed them on the coast and I've lived on the coast. I can tell you, I grew up on the coast. I grew up on John's Pass, if anybody knows West Central Florida. That's where I grew up. And I witnessed it firsthand. I witnessed the entire coastline going from pristine, where you could just walk across dunes, to nothing but condo buildings. <laughs> Solid, as far as the eye can see. You can't even get into a sidewalk anymore. It's so closed off. And I'm managing these properties that took away my, <clears throat> my beautiful beach as a kid. Anyway, not complaining. They've all been good to me. So anyway, thanks for watching this video. I'm going to make a few more. Like I say, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a to-do list video here uh, shortly, and I'll try to get it posted as soon as I can. Uh, the session is coming up, and they're working on stuff, but you know what? <clears throat> they're not working on a revision. That's why I'm posting these videos. So please, if you've stayed with me now, 23 minutes and 18 seconds, um, like the video, subscribe, share it, but make sure it gets shared because we need, we need a voice. You know, the name of my company is Condo Voice. And I used to publish a newspaper within the company. We did that for 15 years. And <clears throat> every condo in HOA got a bundle of them. You know, we did it once a month and uh, in, the, in the Tampa Bay area over here. And it was great because we published the most important things that were going on at the time. It was helpful information, so at least people had some place to get their information from. Now, it's incredible um, how much the industry is changing so rapidly, so significantly. It's the world, uh, and with technology, it just it's speeding everything up. Now there's news to report every day, but we're going to try and stay focused on this bill because this bill, <clears throat> this law, is going to cost a fortune trillions of dollars of commerce. So you can imagine you are going to reach in your pocket and pull out some money. Everybody that takes care of servicing that need is going to make money. This is, this is going to be a huge economic event. It already is. And just wait, once these inspections start getting done, <clears throat> the chronology of it will extend. So I've, brought, I've told you the history, I brought you up to date. The inspections are gonna start happening. <clears throat> the results of those inspections are gonna trigger next events and the whole thing's gonna have a timeline. This timeline is gonna go on for decades. And uh, once it's in place, there's gonna be no stopping it. And condos and HOAs, your fees are going up. That's just all there is to it because the reserves have to be funded, the inspections have to be funded, the repairs have to be funded. <clears throat> And you guys operate on a cash basis. Now, another thing that might happen is you might have to get a loan. You know, banks and lenders are probably looking at that, that whole commerce part of this too. And so I say the entire industry, I mean, if you look at a condo or HOA budget and you see all the different services that you do from, from lawn mowing to painting to <clears throat> management to utilities, um, you know, even taxes, accounting, banking, you name it, right? You touch every facet of society, you're like a little town in and of yourself. Well, 
Um, that's what's happened here. This little building restoration era, let's call it, is going to be a huge commerce boom to the state. But not everybody's going to pay it, only those people that are affected. So, and if this is going to be a truth, and this is going to be a thing, and it looks like it's going to now, they're going to stick with it, then I just believe that, that look, if, it's, if, it's, if, if I have the obligation, then I'm going to pay for it. And I don't mind helping somebody else out. But I'm not going to carry their water, not forever. So the thing is, if you live on the coast, you've got a coastal structure, <clears throat> you got to take care of your property. The people that live inland should not be penalized for your failure to do that. Okay, let's just be fair about this thing. And if we can't be fair, we can be practical. We can rewrite this thing and make sure it makes sense for everybody. All right. Okay, well, thanks for watching. Come on down to condovoice.com. Drop me an email. There's a place on there to contact. If you want to contact us, you have some questions, we'll try to help you out. All right, have a great day.